So I look around the room, you're all familiar with our program here. This is the text to sermon series. And just as a reminder, this semester we're focusing on uh, the topic of application in preaching. So as you're moving from text to sermon throughout the week, thinking about how to how does this text impact the people of God? How does this text impact me, the preacher? What are the implications of the text? How should the people of God apply their lives to this text? These are the kind of questions I've asked our speakers this semester to address. And so as you listen to Dr. Murray Lee speak, you know, you can think of questions along those lines or others. And I'll briefly introduce Murray and then we'll be on our way. Uh, this is Dr. Murray Lee. He's the senior pastor at Cahaba Park Presbyterian Church, which is almost 10 years old. It is, in fact, 10 years old. It is 10 years old. In okay, 10 years old. Yeah. Um, and doing a good work there in Cahaba Park. Several Beeson alumni or students who are either have come through or in the church, one in the room right now, Sean. Um, so a good connection to Beeson. And, and we hire Beeson, that's right. so it's really good that you're here. That's right. Uh, this could be providential for you in a number if of ways. If you want a job. That's right. Um, so, Murray, thanks for coming. Right. I'll, I'll pray for us. Thank God for this food reading, which is just as a reminder, you didn't pay for this. The Lily Endowment paid for this, so we're thankful. That's right. Let me pray for us, and then Murray will get us started. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful um, that you are... Um, a good and righteous and merciful and loving and just Father, and you have shown yourself uh, this way in your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave up his life for us, for our salvation. We thank you for the Spirit uh, who fills us and uh, shows us, gives us eyes to see the glories of your Son and to be able to pray to you now. And we're thankful for this food. We thank you for providing it for us. We thank you for Dr. Murray Lee, for his ministry at Cobb Park. Pray you be with him, be with us now. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, everybody. I'm Murray. So it is 1233. Uh, I have been told this ends at 115. Uh, and I've also been told that the most popular portion of this is the question and answer. So I want this, I have things to say, but I want this to be helpful for you. And so I'm going to stop talking at like 5 till 12. So that's 22 minutes from now, and you'll have 20 minutes. And if you don't have any questions, we can either get out early or I can go again. Uh, and Or you can leave and I can keep going, and uh, neither will offend me. Um, let me tell you a little bit. We, My wife, uh, Kim, and I started the church. We were 27 years old when we began to plant Cahaba Park. And uh, about three years ago, Kim said to me, what were, what were you thinking? <laughs> uh, and candidly, I don't know. Um, but as I got into the regular preaching, week in and week out, I noticed that my sermons and my applications were rather general. And the reason that I noticed uh, that I think that my sermons were rather general is because I thought that for the first handful of years that we had stumbled upon a unicorn of a church. Namely, that our people didn't sin. I mean, it was wonderful. I mean, there were some people, of course, in the congregation who sinned, and we, we could regularly and easily point out their sin. But, uh, but you, know, you know, for the most part, our people didn't sin. Now, that's not true, of course. Uh, and I think the reality is, uh, the reason that I didn't know those things is uh, partly because it takes time to pastor a people to become their shepherd and to care for them, and partly because of my own youth and not understanding the importance of knowing them. 
So I want to say to you just a few things um, at the beginning. Knowing yourself, knowing the Lord, and knowing your people is really important as you think about how to take God's holy word and apply it to God's people. First, of course, to yourself. Some time ago, uh, I was uh, having a challenge with my eight-year-old daughter, getting her to do what I wanted her to do. And uh, she was whining uh, again, and um, in a fit of frustration, I said to her, I demand a heart change right now. And as soon as I said that, I did that too. I laughed out loud because, and she looked at me like, I'm in real trouble because I can't do that. And uh, I looked at her like, what did I just ask you to do? Um, But uh, as I reflected on my demand of a heart change of my daughter, which uh, she cannot do, nor I can, nor can I do of myself, nor can you recall of, uh, ask of others, I thought to myself, I think that that's sometimes what we do with our people in our churches. We tell them to be better, right? We tell them to be like David and slay your Goliaths. Be like Moses. Be like Abraham. Or, uh, or be good and save yourself. Or be better than you previously were. And of course, that arises out of the assumption that the reason that people sin is if they, if they would just understand how they are to act, then they would be able to act how they ought to. Now, of course, that's not true. That if we just tell people, this is how you ought to behave, and, it, the, and the reality is that sin is just a, a the, the problem of sin is just because of our own inability to fully understand how to apply the gospel in our own lives well, then we'd be the hero of every biblical text, and we all know that that's not true either. That, of course, God is the hero of every biblical text. And so what I want to do uh, for just a few moments is to think, how do we prepare our messages in such a way so that our applications are Christ-centered? How do we prepare our messages in such a way so that our applications are Christ-centered. Now, what, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some, some steps that I do each week in terms of preparing a sermon, but, but more, in a, more in the sense of a, a structural way. And then if we want to get down to the real tactical stuff, I'll leave that for the Q&A. Is that okay? So we'll just think broadly, macro-level, structural, how do we... How do we present our messages in such a way so that Christ is the center and focus and hero of every application and sermon that we give? Um, and then if uh, for the Q&A, if we want to talk just real practically, uh, family style type thing, we can do that. So uh, the, the, the problem essentially, I, I suppose I should say the, the first thing, the distinctive of the redemptive message, well, that shakes, the distinctive of redemptive messages are that they are not categorized by just be better, just be good, just, just uh, uh, be like so-and-so. Although we know, of course, that there are B passages in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the Lord. There are B messages. It's not wrong to say be like. Uh, the, the problem is not is when we make them, uh, those B messages, by themselves. Right? If we only say, uh, you just be better, you just be good, you just do so and so and so and so. They are there, they're in context. So how do we prepare our messages in such a way that we understand the proper context? So we're going to say, we want to, under here, the uh, distinctive or redemptive messages, we want to say, we want to stay away from the deadly bees.
Now I should say, as, I, as we get going, that a, a lot of this comes from my own training uh, at Covenant Seminary and Dr. Brian Chapel, who was here a few weeks ago with some uh, local pastors. So if you hear some of his, if you've heard some of his stuff, you'll hear echoes of this for sure. So just to give credit where credit is due, which is another very important thing to do when you're preaching, because that's called plagiarism. Um, <clears throat> the second thing, if we're going to stay away from deadly bees, the second thing is how do we then discover redemptive messages? Recognizing that every biblical text has what's called a Fallen condition focus. Have you heard that? Have you studied that? You know what fallen condition focus is. Who knows what it is? Somebody say. Let's have it. Focus of the text on the fallen condition. Yeah, exactly right. It's really just explaining what the words say, right? <laughs> <laughs> but how do we get, how do we discover the fallen condition focus of the text, right? We ask a series of questions. The first question we ask is, what is the text about, right? Uh, and, and then we interrogate that answer. We say, okay, well, then how do we know? In other words, prove it in the text that we know that this text is about. The second question we answer is, what concerns, what real historical concerns did the text address? The third thing we ask is, what, is the, what do we share in common with, or what's a mutual human condition that we share in common with those two or for whom the text was written that requires the grace of the passage? These are questions that I ask myself every week as I prepare Every outline that I preach, what is the mutual human condition that we share with those two or four whom the text was written that requires the grace of the passage? And once we answer that question, we've got some sense of what the, uh, the fallen condition the text is focusing on. And then we ask ourselves, okay, well, what's the place in the redemptive story of the text? Where does it fit? What was going on in, in the people of Israel when David uh, came to the battlefield with the Philistines and Goliath is taunting them, right? Context is king. It's important not to take passages out of context. So what's going on? What are the historical concerns? What are some of the relational concerns? What are the attributes of Christ's person or work that are evident in the story? And what I mean by this is how, how is Christ portrayed as a prophet providing what we need to know, as a priest providing what we cannot do, as a king providing our rule and our defense, as a shepherd nourishing and guiding, as a friend loving unconditionally, and so on and so forth. Those are attributes of Christ's person. What about attributes of Christ's work? How does he provide food for the hungry, strength for the weak, hope for the desperate, rest for the weary, Forgiveness for the sinner, discipline for the wayward. All these questions we're asking ourselves in tarrying of the text because we want to make sure that our applications are Christ-centered. And then we say, if we have a very clear understanding of what aspect of the fallen condition uh, addresses in that text, we, we ask ourselves, in light of that, what does God require of us in the story? What is true, and what we ought to do in light of that. And, of course, we know that that imperative, that uh, what to do, is based on the indicative of what is true, and it's not the other way around. More of that in a, in a minute. As we think about how to motivate and enable uh, obedience with the grace principles that we've served we have to ask four questions of application. So we're going to say the four cues of application. Can anybody guess what they are? Very, very basic questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Where? Why? And the ever important how. The what question is the instruction or belief specifics. The where is the situational specific. It's the it's the taking of. Uh, let's say you're applying uh, 
the way that God's uh, mercy is described to us in Matthew chapter 11, where he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll provide rest. How do we apply this uh, to the mother who is exhausted with her children at the same time with the uh, father uh, who is struggling with uh, making ends meet at work, at the same time with the uh, pastor who's trying his dead level best to prove himself and his worth by how hard he works and earn his love for God that way. So what you do is you take a, a, situ, a situ, you, t- you take situational specificity. That's a hard word to say, phrase to say. Situational specificity, and say, okay, for the seminary student or for the pastor who is struggling to understand how their own identity is wrapped up entirely. They think their own identity is wrapped up entirely in what they do and how they perform. But the Bible here in Matthew chapter 11 says that's not true because your identity isn't found in what you do, but in who you are in Christ. And so when you think about preparing a sermon and you think that your worth is going to be on display for the people of God and they're going to judge you based on how well you do, you need to remember this text. Or when you're preparing a talk for seminary students over lunch. You take a, 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 you take a specific situation and you apply it in a rounded sort of way, situational specificity, and then you unroll it. Well, it's not just for the seminary student and the pastor. It's also for the mother who struggles uh, keeping it together with her children. It's also for the father who's making, struggling to make ends meet. It's also for the whatever, you know. So you tell people exactly the way it is that you want them to take the text and apply it in those specific situations. So, you, so the, the, the what is instructional belief, the where is the situational specificity, the why answers the question of motivation, and the how answers the question of enablement. So let's talk about those two things really quickly because those two things are very important. Now I want you to notice how hard I work to get the outline to rhyme the, or not rhyme, uh, what's the word where you use all, um, yeah, thank you, it's alliterated, right, the delight of redemption, and I'll be candid, uh, uh, it's really a stretch to use the word delight, but it's just because I wanted to alliterate it, and I want you to think that's impressive. Um, (laughs) The delight, what's the grace, that's really the word I wanted to use, what's the grace uh, of redemptive messages. That's what I just mentioned a minute ago, that the imperative rests on the indicative and it's never, ever, ever, ever the other way around. Think about the Ten Commandments. How does it begin? Do you remember in Exodus chapter 20? What does the Lord say? What does he say? Say it, you got to say it loudly. because. Yep, who? Yep. Out of the, house of, out, out of the land of slavery? And then what does he say? Command number one. What is it? You shall know the gods before me. So he tells them what is true, who they are, and then he tells them what they ought to do. Think about the book of Ephesians. The entire book is organized just this way. The first three chapters are a statement of who you are in Jesus. The final four chapters are based on who you are in Jesus This is how, therefore, you should act in Christ, as a person of Christ. Every imperative of Scripture is based on the indicatives of Scripture, and they're never the other way around. Because if they are the other way around, this is, it's it's, it's not just important from a theoretical standpoint, from understanding that our sanctification is based on our justification rather than our justification based on our sanctification, but it plays a very practical role in the way you talk to other people. Think of the way that I would talk to my own children. Uh, We'll use another one of my kids. Ella, I told you to clean your room. 
you're a bad girl because you didn't do that. No, I don't say that to Ella. But what have I just communicated to her were I to say those things? Who you are is based on what you do. And the problem with that is that what you do is a never changing roller coaster, right? Rather, now I don't, I try not to say this either uh, uh, because it sounds uh, overly uh, wooden, but rather, if we were to say things this way, Ella, you are my daughter. And my daughters obey their parents. I told you to clean your room, and I expect you to act like who you are. Now, the difference in those two, you see, is massive. One, I've, I've affirmed who she is in light of my love for her. And because of who she is in light of my love for her, she can then act out of my love in order to obey me. Now, on a much, much, much grander scale, God takes his word and applies it to us in the same way. He says, Sean, you are my child, and my children act like this. It's the imperatives of Scripture based on the indicatives. Do you see why I chose the word delight, actually? Because it makes our task so much more joyful when we really are ultimately an application reminding people of who they are in Jesus. Of God's great love for them in Christ. And that power of Christ's love, that why motivation is the how, the enablement, that the love of Christ is both the why and the how. Think about, consider these passages. Write them down if you'd like. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Think about the way that the love of Christ is portrayed both as the motivation and enablement for all we're called to do. So when we're applying God's word in a Christ-centered, redemptive way, your job is to tell people of God's great love for them so that their heart will be so filled with the love of God that there will be no room for the love of the world. Because ultimately, that's what we get to do. We get to point people to Jesus and say, how great is our God? Now, I know that I just took a fire hydrant and pointed it at all of you. Because 20 minutes, 19, goes by pretty quickly. But I'm going to stop there. I suppose we could have more to say. But I'm going to stop there and ask the question, what, how did that strike you? What, what questions do you have? We can talk particulars, if you'd like, of what a sermon prep week for me looks like. We can talk particulars about how to grow in your knowledge of understanding those who are in your congregation and what that looks like for your application. Or any other questions that you want to. And when I say the word anything, it, it's kind of like the way that a, a, a server comes to your table and says, how was everything? <laughs> he or she doesn't mean the lighting in the parking lot, right? They mean pertaining to the dining experience. <laughs> so we can talk about anything pertaining to this. <laughs> what question? Yeah. Obviously, um, knowing your congregation <clears throat> is incredibly important. You mentioned that in the very beginning, and when it comes to application, um, what would you say, you mentioned time spent preparing preaching, what would you say the amount of time you spend in a given week preparing to preach is, and how does that correlate to how much time you spend individually pastoring people aside from the pulpit? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to give you my answer, but then I'll, I want you to take it and apply it to the way that you know yourself, right? Because... Uh, uh, Knowing yourself in sermon preparation is very important. Uh, 
because you need to know the way you learn, the way you remember, the way that uh, you best work in whatever time block. Some of you work in best in 30-minute increments. Some of you work best if you sit down for over six hours, right? My week looks like, uh, in my sermon prep week, uh, begins, uh, I had the passage laid out in advance. Most of them, uh, I go away in the summer for a week and I, I plan out sermons that are a year in advance. So I know the passage that I'm preaching on going into the week. And then from on Tuesday mornings from 8 to 11, I do the bulk of my research about the particular passage. Now, um, most of the time I'm preaching ex, uh, expository sermons, and so that research is building, right? You understand? So it's not just confined to those three hours, but I've been, if I'm going through the book of Ephesians, I've been in Ephesians for a while. And so I, I land Tuesday, hopefully, uh, at 11 a.m. with an outline. And that outline has the following condition focus underlined, the main point proposition in bold, and my main points. And if, I, uh, if the Holy Spirit so moves, maybe an illustration or two as it's kind of come along, just sort of outline. Wednesday morning, the next day, from 8 to 11, I write it out in full. Uh, three hours, 8 to 11. I'm done by 11 pretty much every Wednesday. I mean, I can count on two hands the times that I haven't been done at 11. And I'm pretty strict about how I use that time. So I close the door. The blinds are closed in my office. If you prefer to stay at home, you got to know yourself. And people know that unless the house is burning down and unless it's kind of coming close to the door, right, don't just let me keep going. And so I put it away on Thursday. I don't, even, I don't really think about it. Friday, I pick it up again, and I read over it, and I read over it, and I pray over it, and I'm sort of like, uh, like you bring a, a soup to a slow simmer. Saturday, do the same thing, put the manuscript down. Sunday, get up and preach. Yeah, it's just a handful of times, usually in the morning. Um, when I'm fresh, when my mind's ready. And then, um, and so the other part of your question, how much time do I spend? Uh, so all the rest of my time is spent doing various things. You know, pastors only really work a couple hours a week on Sunday. <laughs> so I play a lot of PlayStation. and I'm kidding, this is being recorded. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for what you said. It's very... It's very clear and uh, stimulating for me. But I was just thinking about how the, the grace of re the redemptive mes message works a bit more. It felt like from the example that you gave that the application was for me to go back and do something and, you know, be understanding who I am more and, you know, there's still a kind of bent towards doing. Do you, do you think you could explore kind of the grace of that application and... The grace works. of the application or the way that it works out practically in terms of breakdown in, within the sermon? However you choose to answer that. It's up to you. Well, I'll start, and then I'll look over at you, and you nod if this is right, and you say no if I'm not on, right? So um, every, where's my thing? Here it is. Um, application is the main thing to be done in, in preaching, right? Um, this thing doesn't go together. It's the main thing to be done in preaching, but it doesn't mean that we exclude it to the other things, right? So, um, uh, and you, I think you all know this, right? So um, each, each point ought to have, in theory, explanation, illustration, and application, right? And you can even divide them a third, a third, and a third. Or... You can do illustration, uh, that's two L's, illustration, explanation, application, or illustration, application, you know. This, so this would be the inductive model of preaching. This would be the deductive model of preaching. This begins with the propositional truth, then state, plates, and proves it, illustrates it, and applies it. This begins with uh, an idea, 
that's illustrated. It's either then explained or applied, and then it's stated, place, proved, and it ends with a statement of, uh, of truth or proposition. You're bringing people to it. Um, and so what you're doing in a grace-based message is just you're, you're showing how all of, all of Scripture, if Luke 24 is true, and it is, um, where uh, Jesus is on uh, the road to Emmaus and he is revealing how all of Scripture refer, is about him, right? Then all of the Bible, if all the Bible is about Jesus, then we've got to discover in every text how that is. Is it either preparing for the work of Christ? Is it descriptive of the work of Christ? Is it predictive of the work of Christ? Or is it resulting from the work of Christ? And when we, when we model, when we design our messages uh, like that, we are necessarily taking a grace-based focus to, or a redemptive focus to preaching. We're not telling people, just be like Paul. We're saying, look at what Paul said throughout his ministry. He was the least of the apostles. Now he's the, the, the yeah, so least of the apostles, least in the kingdom, and then he says he's the worst sinner, right? So uh, when we say those things, we're understanding both, both the historical context and also what that means from a redemptive standpoint about how to apply Christ. How does Christ's redemptive work meet and address Paul throughout the course of his ministry, and how should we apply that to our lives? Yeah or no? Yeah? yeah. Mm, maybe, maybe we'll talk after. All right, yeah. Um, hey, thanks for your talk. Um, I, I work at Oak Mountain Prez, and I was, I was in a session meeting last night, and Bob Flayhart was saying just about the exact same stuff oh, in I'm regards sorry. to in, yeah <laughs> in in regards to what you were saying um, with the indicative and the imperative um, give yep. that that whole shame spiel and and I'm on board with that completely I just want to preface my question if it doesn't sound like I am I am um, how is it that you apply that theme or that motive to text where it doesn't seem most naturally to fit and so I'm thinking maybe primarily like the seven letters at the beginning of Revelation if you don't do this, I will come and, you know, remove your lampstand. I will, you know, there are, if, if this action doesn't take place, there will be very negative consequences, which may or may not have soteriological effects. Um, so how, how do you think in preaching that we apply that very true motif of indicative is more important um, than the imperative or indicative comes before um, in texts that... You know, might seem you know what it is that you do will are indicate. unclear. Sure. Yeah. Great question, and I think that uh, we have to think about it in two ways. Um, I'm going to give the easy answer first, and then take the harder approach second. The easy answer is all Scripture interprets Scripture, right? So, the letter to the churches in Revelation are not in isolation. It comes in the context of all of the revelation of God, not just the book of Revelation, but all of the books of the Bible. And so how do we think about what God says to God's people when they are wayward? You've got to do the hard work of examining that throughout the, um, the witness of Scripture. The other thing is that we need to understand how Whenever God gives a command, he also tells them who they are in Christ in context. So I'll just ask the question, to whom is John, to, to whom is the Spirit through John writing in the book of Revelation? The churches. And, uh, and what makes a church? And so in light of the fact that they belong to Jesus, how ought they behave? Don't, don't let that get lost on you, because it's easy. Don't let it get lost on the fact that John, in that sense, is writing to churches in whom the Spirit is at work. Yeah, great question. What other questions? Yeah. Um, I've sat in this room with some preachers who have, I think, approached this 
application as to what you describe in some of the methodologies. And um, certain ones that I've sat under, not all, but certain ones, after sitting in them for an extended period of time, several years, the preaching became, it seemed like to me at least, very predictable. And um, it seemed like there was kind of this tone that every text was fit into in terms of sort of like this raw gospel indicative imperative. Yeah, it just became very predictable. And you kind of, I already knew where they were going when they were halfway through their sermon, and, and it became um, harder to engage sometimes with the preaching. And not not that they were saying anything wrong, but like I said, just because of the, uh, the predictable <coughs> nature of it, um, it, it. Yeah, and maybe that says more about me than the preacher. But, um, <laughs> but as a, just a question, how do you avoid not um, just kind of giving sort of the same... Um, general application with different words every week. Does that make sense? It does. I used to wonder and worry that what I said was just going to be the same thing repeated over and over again. And then I heard a pastor tell me in his 80s, you better be afraid if you don't. Um... Our message ought to be the same every week because the message of God's Word is the same. Now, I understand what you're also saying. Um, how do we be, how do we continue to grow? Maybe, maybe you're not asking this, and maybe I'll just rephrase your question. Uh, how do we continue to grow and develop as communicators of God's Word and not just rely on our same tricks? Well, your students, the learning doesn't stop, you know. There are all kinds of resources out there. Avail yourself of them. Listen to other preachers. Talk with other people. Ask them how they're applying text. Have um, uh, two or three mentors that you can rely on. Those things are very important. But message needs to be the same because God's Word is the same. Um, so you talked about a week you kind of get away and plan yeah. the whole year What can you describe kind of that process and you know you talked about the why like what are the whys and, and how you choose which text you're going to exposit yeah. the rest of the year sure great um, I have three different kinds of planning times throughout the year uh, I have a weekly planning time on Thursday, a quarterly planning time, quarterly, uh, and then a yearly planning time. That's that that week away. All, during those times, I'm I'm working on rather than in the church on the organization of the church. So, as I'm spending time on Thursday and those quarterly meetings with uh, other key uh, staff, and then the week away, I'm asking questions like, what are we doing as a church that if we continue to do uh, will be to the detriment of God's people? What are we not doing that we ought to be doing? What are we doing that's really good and we need to continue doing it? And then what have God's people heard from God's word over the past, and I keep a record, over the past couple of years, have we been steady in the Old Testament? And boy, it looks like we need some Jesus time from his own, in the red letters. You know what I mean? Oh boy, it looks like we need to spend some time in the pastoral epistles. Oh, there are some really important top, and, and by the way, as we, and as you sort of lay out your year and plan it like that, you not only set your, 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 um, uh, things that you need to do from an organizational standpoint, these are the things that we need to do or the church will continue to follow the same sin patterns. And these are things that we need to talk about from God's Word. But then you also don't be so wooden that you're afraid when important cultural issues happen, you're, you're not so tied to your calendar that you can't just stop and say, hey, this is going on. And we need to know what God's Word says about this. So you can build those in as you go. So you don't hold it as tightly as God's Word. Uh, you know, but you you know you hold, hold hold your calendar sort of loosely. I can show it to you afterwards. I have it with me. Yeah, if you'd like. Yeah. Time for one more question. Being 
recorded, so I have to take this. Okay. Um, so when you're when you're exegeting your congregation and determining where our application needs to fit, how I'll use myself as an example because I'm a member of your church. How do you avoid basically getting up there and saying, "Here's Sean's problem," and here's what Sean, here's where Sean needs to be convicted of his sin. Yeah. So Sean's not the only person with that problem. <laughs> Chances. <laughs> Um, I find that God deals with me. If I'm, in, if, if, I'm, if I'm really paying attention, and there are weeks that I'm not, plenty of weeks that I'm not, um, but if, I, if I'm paying attention to what the Spirit is doing in my life, uh, I find that God works on my heart um, with the text before I even start thinking about all those people that I love in our congregation. Now, I also know that there are broadly folks that are really having a hard time with this and folks that are rejoicing over this and folks that are wondering about this. And so it just kind of, it takes time, it kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning, it takes time just really kind of knowing yourself and allowing the Spirit to work in your heart. And also to know your people. And um, I should say, finally, uh, never, ever um, make an example out of somebody from the pulpit. Um, And we say, yeah, of course, right? We should never do that. But don't ever do that. (laughs) Uh, Guilt works once. (laughs) And that's the only time it works. Um, so. Okay.